just like Jesus, right? To give sight to the blind, liberty to the captives. Wow. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Wow. The Bible says, Jesus says he came to bind up the brokenhearted. You know, I'm comforted by his words. There's something about hearing this song. There's something about hearing the words. There's something about reading in the scripture. And he does give us grace. And what we have to understand and what many of us sometimes forget is that grace is empowerment. It's God's empowerment for you. For your life. He gives you grace. He gives you favor. He gives you empowerment for what he's called you to do. He empowers you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. Doesn't leave you alone. Doesn't leave you broken down and defeated. There's grace. 2017, praise God, some of you had some amazing grace that you didn't know about. Is that right, Joe? Well, man, Joe over there in the corner will tell you about Grace. We'll have to have him share his testimony soon. We just helped him move into his new home. Man, praise the Lord. Praise God. Teresa, you know about grace. It'd be one thing if we could, we didn't know. It'd be one thing if we were just walking around defeated, beaten up. But it's another thing where you can be a testimony and you can say, wow, God's grace was all over that. I couldn't make it if not for the grace of God. I wouldn't be standing. If not for the grace of God, I wouldn't be sitting here. If not for the grace of God, I wouldn't have got out of bed. You know, some people can't get out of bed this morning, physically and mentally. Either they're in bondage to depression or their body just can't handle it. They're in pain. They can't make it. Man, it's God's grace that takes us through. That's grace. That's grace truly is amazing. Some of you are here today and for all intents and purposes, you shouldn't even be here. You should have died a couple times, a few times. You should have lost it all. And you should, you should be crying. Some of y'all have news right now that you're still not past it. And you should be crying right now about the grace of God. You're just holding it together. It's just great sustains us. We want to thank him for his grace. Lord, we thank you, Father. Mm, we just want to thank you, Lord God. We cry out and we say, hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. Father, I thank you for your grace on the single mothers in this place, Lord God. Father God, raising kids, Lord God, and we know how children can be, Father, but you have given us grace. I thank you for those, Lord God, who came through the hurricane this year, Lord God, for your grace upon our families and upon our homes, Lord God. I thank you for the grace upon the businesses represented here, Lord God. Your grace, Lord God, upon marriages in this place, Lord God. Father, we can't help but thank you, Lord God. Father, there, Lord God, you know the struggles that we've been through, Lord God. And you know, Father God, the challenges and the trials. Yet, Lord God, you've given us the grace to be here, standing here. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Your grace is sufficient. I thank you that your word says your grace is sufficient. For your power is made perfect in our weakness. And we stand on it, Lord God. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that where we've been weak, you've been strong in 2017. And even in the hereafter, we're going to be stronger. Why? Not because we're so great, Lord, you know that, Father, but because we are broken vessels who need you to keep us together, Lord. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Lord, we cling to you, Father. We need you, Lord. Would you empower us by your spirit, Father? God, would you speak your word, Lord God, clearly, Father God, communicate your heart to your people, Lord God. Father, would you just show up, Lord God, and do what you do best, Lord God. Transform our understanding, Lord God. We don't want information, we want transformation, Lord God. We want transformation now, transformative wisdom in Jesus' name. We're ready, Lord God. We're ready, Lord God. We lift up our hands and we say, we're ready, Lord God. We're ready to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo! Praise God. 
praise God. You got to be ready for what God's got for you. You got to be ready. Because if you're not ready, he's still going to throw it at you. Right? You ever, you ever seen a kid, you know, or, or an adult for that matter? I'm kind of that, that clumsy, uncoordinated one at times. Somebody throw a ball at you and you're like, oh, 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 oh. And, you know, you might catch a ball at your face. You know, some of us are not ready for what comes, but it's still coming. It's still going to be there. So I got a message for you entitled, Turn Up the Heat. Turn up the heat. I'm not just talking about because it's cold outside or we'll turn up the heat in our homes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spiritual atmosphere. I'm talking about going into 2018. You know, the Lord gave me this word a couple months ago, turn up the heat. He gave me the scriptures and he revealed to me what it means for us going forward as the body of Christ, the people of God, to step it up, to take it to another level, to stand out in such a way that, that, that our community is going to see it, that our family is going to see it, that, that, that we're going to look in the mirror and see it. That we're going to say, oh my goodness, there's transformation. There is change. The Bible says that we are called to be new creatures, right? Every man in Christ is a new creature, right? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, right? So, so we can't be the same people we were before. There's some things that you've literally got to leave behind. And I love how we can look at the calendar, flip the page, and the boundary line is right there. You can say January 2018. There's a boundary line right here. Nothing is going to cross into this. That was horrible from last year. That was detrimental from last year. That tried to take me out last year. That broke my heart last year. That broke me down last year. Nothing is going to cross over into the territory where God has called you to flourish. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be sharing with you out of Daniel chapter 3 this morning. Daniel chapter 3. So if you want to turn there, you can get prepared for that. Daniel chapter 3. I want to give you some background before I do, though. Because the Bible talks about a man, a wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was one of the most vicious kings to ever exist. One of the most conquering, successful kings to ever exist. He was a conqueror of nations, a conqueror of peoples. Nebuchadnezzar got really good at conquering. And one of the territories, one of the peoples that he conquered were the Israelites who lived in Jerusalem in the land of Judah. And when he conquered the land of Judah, his custom was to take people, pull them into his kingdom, and assimilate them into the ways of the Babylonians. So he would take the Israelites at this, at, at right around the 6th century B.C., he pulled them into Babylon, and he said, okay, you are going to now forget your customs, forget your culture, forget who you are as a people, forget your identity, and you are going to become like my people. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar found that there were some very young, able-bodied young men, the Bible says. He exalted them to a position in his kingdom where he had them trained for three years. He put them through this Babylonian boot camp, so to speak. He set them up to make sure that they learned the customs, they learned the traditions, they learned all the etiquette of the royal court. And then after three years, he tested all these people that he conquered. Well, he went forward. He looks at these Israelites that he conquered. He tested them, and he says, wow, there's these four young men that shined. They just shined out of all the people that he had. They just stood up, and, man, they were amazing. This was Daniel, who the book is named after. There was who, the one we call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had different names in the Hebrew, but I'm going to refer to them by their Babylonian name. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three men stand out. Daniel happens to be, through circumstance, interpreting one of the king's dreams. He's exalted to a high position in the kingdom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a position as well, just not as high as Daniel. But there came a time, how many of you know, when God gives you a position, there will always come a time where there is a condition, right? When you have a position, it presents a condition. God will always position you somewhere to enact certain conditions upon your role. See, oftentimes we think we get somewhere because we're so good and special and cute, right? Because we're so talented and wonderful, right? We think, oh, man, that's great. I worked so hard to get the corner office. You know what I'm saying? I worked so hard to be the big shot. I worked so hard, and now I am enjoying the fruit of my labors. No, God put you there because he's got a purpose and plan for that position, and it may be 20 years. 
You may not even know, but he's going to cause you to make radical change through that position that he's given you. So we've got to be very careful, very strategic about God. We have to ask ourselves, matter of fact, we have to say, God, why did you put me here? What did you call me to do? God, what are you calling out of me? Because it's very easy to get comfortable in a position, but it's a whole other thing to understand the conditions behind it. You ever buy a new electronic device? You ever buy a, a new phone or a new iPad? You know, I'm that person who always flips and skips to the terms and conditions page. You know, that 13-page document that nobody wants to read? The terms and conditions. Nobody wants terms and conditions, right? Nobody wants that, right? Nobody wants to read the warranty and the fine print and all that. But when you go get your car fixed, then, then you should have read them terms and conditions, right? Because what happens, they say, well, you know, that's going to be so many thousand dollars. Oh, no, no, I have a warranty. Oh, really? Well, you didn't read the fine print, right? Sometimes the conditions come back to get you. So we have to be very careful. We have to understand the conditions of how God positions us. And God always positions us in such a way that he causes us to live like Christ wherever we are. Wherever you are, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. In Romans 8, 29, it says we're conformed to the image, the pattern of Christ. And John says in his, uh, in his epistle, in 1 John 4, 17, he says, love is made complete if in this world we are like Christ. So one of our challenges is, is no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter how we've been exalted, we are called to be like Christ. Christ. We are called to share that. We are called to, to impart that. We are called to live it out. And there will always come a time, there will always come a time when you are called to give account for your life. When you are called to reveal whose you belong to, whose you are. Not who you are, but whose you are. And the time came for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to reveal their allegiance, to reveal their hearts, to reveal their desire to follow God no matter what. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, it starts out with Nebuchadnezzar raising up a giant statue, a 90-foot golden statue, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. And he had this big party. The Bible says he invited all the big who's who's, the governors, the state traps, the prefects, everybody who was who's who. Huge party, a sea of people for miles around because Nebuchadnezzar is like, look, you guys have got to see my statue, but also you have to worship it. Everybody in the kingdom of Babylon is going to worship this statue that I have erected. And how many of you know a party is not good without a DJ, right? No party is a real party unless you got a DJ. So Nebuchadnezzar hired, hired a DJ. He hired an MC, and dude gets on the mic, and in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 4, he's on the mic, and he's telling everybody, everybody, listen up, right? It says that he proclaimed nations and peoples of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse 6, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately, not later, immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Wow. Therefore, as soon as they heard, everybody heard the sound of the music. As soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everybody bows down. It's crazy, right? And how many of you have ever been in that environment? I don't want y'all to get all religious on me and all sanctimonious on me, right? How many of y'all have been in that environment? The music is pumping, the party's hot, and everybody is going along with the music, right? Y'all getting quiet on me. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me put this into perspective, because some of y'all are still fronting. I want to put this into perspective, right? What happens when the DJ throws on that electric slide, right? Some of y'all old folks know about that. Right? Some of y'all want to forget y'all was doing the electric slide. Electric. Right? Some of y'all don't want to don't remember, and it might be on tape, so you got to watch your Facebook. You might want to delete it. But some of y'all, you've been doing the cha-cha slide. Right? Y'all was cha cha and real smooth with it, weren't you? Right? For some of you new ones, it was the whip and nay-nay. Right? 
There's, there's, a, there's a few different ones out there, right? I heard somebody was just hating the Quan. I said, hate the Quan? What's that? There's all kind of new ones, right? But the funny thing is this. Music is a big motivator for worship, right? It's pretty scary. It's pretty dangerous. I remember the days when I was up in the club, man, the music was hitting, the party was jumping, everybody was on the floor. It just was what it was. Even now, the kids go to skating rink. The music is live. All the kids want to skate around, right? Music is a motivator. It can motivate us in the right direction or in the wrong direction, right? That's why when we have people up here singing and, and praising the Lord, we call them worship leaders because they're leading us in worship through music. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, look, when the music plays, y'all start to worship. Everybody bows down, everybody except these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this is where the position and the condition come into play. These young men are left standing. Everybody's bowing down, and suddenly there's a problem. People are looking around. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. What's wrong with them? Maybe they didn't hear it. So the Bible tells us in verse 8 of Daniel chapter 3, at this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. So they were very upset. They were like, whoa, whoa, hold up. Right? They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. So they start kissing up to the king. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. I'm going to paraphrase this real quick. They were saying to the king, listen, king, we're not crazy, right? We heard what you said. D didn't, didn't, I just want to get it correct now. Didn't you say to anybody who does not bow down when the music plays, anybody who doesn't go with the flow, anybody who doesn't indulge the flesh, anybody who doesn't follow the command to worship this image, aren't they going to be thrown into a blazing furnace? King, did you not say that? King's like, yeah, of course I said that. They say, then why are these guys standing up, right? Sometimes, right? There, matter of fact, there will be a time where you are called to stand up and stand out. God has positioned you in such a way. And if you haven't been there, you're getting there. He's going to position you in such a way where you're called to stand up and stand out. And you can't go with the okie doke. You can't go with the flow. You can't go with what everybody else wants to do. You're going to be that eyeball. You're going to be the Christian. You're going to be the one who doesn't do that and ruins all the fun and you're a fuddy-duddy. But you say, no, I can't do this because this is against God. I cannot dishonor God this way. And this is what these men found themselves doing. Their position was in the kingdom of Babylon. But their heart condition, their heart condition was to serve the Lord no matter what, to serve him always. They had their hearts fixed on God. And if I can uh, share with you a phrase that the Lord had given me for this year, it's radical obedience. Radical obedience. That means it's going to look pretty crazy. That means that some people might say to you, I don't know about that, man. But you're saying, this is what the Lord has shown me. This is what God's word has revealed to me. This is the truth, and I can't go against it no matter what. A radical obedience, and that's what these young men had. You see, praise God, you have to understand there's a great reward. There's a great reward for faithfulness, but there's also a great cost. There's always a great cost. As we are faithful to God. It's a great cost. We sing, we'll never know how much it costs, right? To see the sin upon the cross. We sing that, right? Because it was so great a cost that Christ paid for being obedient, for being faithful to the Father. You see, there's always going to come a cost. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready to step out and stick out, stand out and be obedient and pay the cost that comes with it. The Bible says in Daniel 3.13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He says, I want to hear it from your own mouth. Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? In other words, is it true that you don't want to conform to my pattern, right? 
Because the Bible says, look, we know we are conformed to be in the image of Christ. Right? These young men, before they were born, were predestined to look like Jesus. Even before Jesus was on the scene, even before the baby in the manger was born, these young men were called to look like him, to reveal his heart and his character and his nature. And so he says, look, you don't serve my gods, right? Nebuchadnezzar is highly offended at this point. But see, he goes on, he says, now when you hear, when you hear the music, the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, he says, very good. He says, we're good. Just do what I told you to do. Just give in. Just compromise. Just do whatever I said, and we're fine. How many of you have been in positions like that? Where if you just go with the flow, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You might work a job, and they say, you know what? Just lie to the customer. It's all right. It's okay. This is what we do. This is how we do things, right? Right? You might be in a relationship, and somebody's like, you know, it's okay to compromise your purity. Okay? It's okay if we step out. It's just going to be one drink. You know it ain't going to be one drink. You already know. That's real, right? You're, you're pushing the compromising and compromising and compromising. He says, we'll be all good if you just give in, if you just make provision for the flesh, right? But he says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So the king is posing a challenge now. He says, listen, you got to understand, guys, I'm trying to make the deal sweet for you. I'm trying to give you the package, the, the perks, and trying to give you everything so that you can stay in my kingdom. And this kingdom, this kingdom that is passing and temporary, Nebuchadnezzar thought his kingdom would be forever, but it was passing, it was temporary. But he's telling them, stay in my kingdom, right? That's what he's saying to them. He's saying, forego the eternal kingdom and stay here with me and do what I say to do. But these young men knew the truth. And Nebuchadnezzar sadly didn't understand that his position came with a condition from God. He was so worried about destroying their flesh and throwing them into a furnace. What he didn't understand was that God set him up to be someone to test his people. That was his position, right? Now, see, when we get this, when we understand this, our understanding is radically transformed because we might wonder, we might be stressed and flustered. Many people will say, well, well, why does God not just destroy the devil right now? Why do we go through all this mess? Why do we have to deal with this? Why is he constantly prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? And, you know, the truth of it is, is that God uses him as a tool to destroy the flesh. If that sounds strange, read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. I'm not going to get into it, but you can dig into that on your own. He's a tool in God's hand for the destruction of the flesh. And see, what Satan is very good at doing is tempting, and, and he will tempt you to indulge the flesh, right? Like Nebuchadnezzar did, just bow down. He'll tempt you to indulge the flesh, engage the flesh. But on the other hand, what God is using him for what God uses the enemy for is to destroy our flesh, to destroy our pride. Why? Because when the offer comes, when the compromise comes, you can say, no, I'm not going there. You can say, no, I'm not giving in. No, I'm not going to be that. No, I'm not going to live that. And see, I love the response that they give. They give this response to Nebuchadnezzar in verse, what verse is this? Praise the Lord. Verse 16. Man, I'm so excited. Praise the Lord. They give this response. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. So in other words, they say, look, no explanation. We're just letting you know we will not give in. We will not compromise no matter what. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And so what are they saying? They're saying, look, we believe in God. We trust in God. And king, you can't do anything about it. King, 
God is more powerful than you. God is greater than you. God is greater than everyone who will try to destroy you, right? He is greater than anybody who will try to subdue you. Why? Because the Bible says that we are called to put the flesh to death. We are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so what does that mean? That means that you and I have already put to death the misdeeds of the body and the flesh. And now we've surrendered to God anyway. So when they go and say, oh, oh, we're going to destroy you. We're going to take you out. They're like, dude, you don't understand. You can't kill what's already dead. What are you going to do? You're going to kill my flesh. You're going to harm the body. I've already subdued the flesh. I'm already with him. I'm already standing in the truth. And I am already dwelling in an eternal kingdom. What are you going to do, Nebuchadnezzar? What are you going to do? Right? Verse 18. But even if he does not, even if God does not deliver us, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You see, these guys had their hearts and their minds fixed on a radical obedience, and nothing was going to keep them from worshiping God. And see, that's exactly what we're called to be coming forward in 2018. Radical obedience, which gives way to a radical leadership. And I don't just mean the leadership of a church, people standing on the stage, people speaking and preaching and teaching and singing. I mean the body of Christ. When you have a radical obedience, you are walking in radical leadership. Wherever you go, people are looking to you for the answers. People are looking to you. Why? Because you don't make provisions for the flesh. You're not walking around stressed like everybody else. You're not depressed like everybody else. You're not frustrated like everybody else. And nobody can get you off of the track that God has you set for. You see, these men were calm speaking to the king. They were fine. They said, your majesty... They were okay. Why? Because he could not make them get out of the will of God and engage their flesh. See, many of us, the problem is, you know, I hear many believers saying things like, they made me so mad. They made me so upset. Gosh, I'm so frustrated. I can't even sleep. This is so horrible. They made me this way. They made me sad. I'm so sad. Hey, nobody can make you do anything. And we've got to apply the truth to it. Nobody can make you any kind of way. If anything, you, the problem is yours. That's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. If anything, the problem is yours. The problem is the flesh, right? If somebody pokes at your flesh and you react out of the flesh, you in the flesh. Get out the flesh. Kill the flesh, right? Subdue the flesh. Destroy the flesh, man, and get right with God. And then what happens? I don't care what threat comes your way. I don't care who says they don't like you. I don't care if you get the breakup text. I don't care if you don't get invited to parties or whatever the case may be. Right? You're good. Why? Because you say, look, I'm not reacting in the flesh. I'm in the spirit of God. And I know that anything that tries to come to my heart, any weapon formed against me, it will not prosper. I'm not thinking with the mind of the flesh. The Bible says the mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the spirit is life and peace. I got peace. I'm sleeping good on my bed at night. If somebody's angry or frustrated or they're mad at me, they're, this or that, they're upset or whatever, that's theirs. You can have it, bro. I'm good. I'm not, I'm not sweating. I'm sweating because I'm preaching right now, but I'm not sweating. Right? I'm not worried about it. You see, these guys won't even worry about getting thrown into a blazing furnace. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar got so angry at their response. He was like, I cannot believe this. He's outraged. They're embarrassing him in front of everybody. And he makes the furnace seven times hotter. He gets it blazing. The Bible says that, that a man went to open one of the soldiers of Babylon, opened the furnace, and the furnace roasted him on the spot. It was so hot, he couldn't even hardly open the door. And so these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were bound and they were thrown into the furnace. The Bible says they tripped and stumbled even fell into the flames. And for sure, if you saw this sight, you would think that was it. Listen, wh why didn't you just give in? Why didn't you just bow down? It wasn't worth it, guys. But what happens? 
We read in verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He's like, whoa, what in the world is going on, right? He says to his advisors, he's like, wait, wait, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, well, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed. And a fourth looks like the son of the gods. This is Nebuchadnezzar saying it the best way he can. He's like, what? And I cannot believe it. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Now, now this is a contrast to what he was just saying earlier. Dude is furious. Dude is angry. Dude's going off. He's just about cussed him out. And now he's saying, servants of the Most High God. You see, that's the power of God that we are called to walk in. And in 2018, this is the power of God that you are going to go in when you surrender in radical obedience and give way to radical leadership. What does it mean? It means that you are not going to give in to such a point where people are going to say, wow, servant of the most high God, look at you. Man, you look great. I mean, I wanted to hate you. I was, I, 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 I just... I wanted to be mad at you, but oh my goodness, I can't even be mad. You look great. You're on Facebook. Your family looks good. Everything's going great. You're doing wonderful. Gosh, I, I, I wanted to hate. I, people who want to hate you can't even hate you. Even the haters love you. You see, this is powerful, man. This is, this is powerful. Praise the Lord. Man, the Bible says, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the safe trap, prefects, governors, royal advisors, all the who's who's crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not burned their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. You sit around a campfire, what happens? You smell like smoke. These guys step into a blazing furnace, and they walk out fresh and clean. Perfect spotless. Wow. And God, this is the best part. God was with them. God was right there with them. Wow. You see, fire is meant to harm the flesh. If you've ever seen anybody get burned, it doesn't take much. You can get burned on a stove and it'll harm your flesh. It'll take the flesh right off of your skin. It'll, it'll take you down to the bone if you get burned bad enough. But see, what I love is that because these young men had their flesh surrendered to God, they were un harmed. These guys, I, I want to I submit to you this, these guys were already on fire, so you can't burn it up. You can't burn them, burn them up, right? They were already on fire. You see, when you're already on fire for God, right, you can't, you can't burn up, right? You can't be harmed. Why? Because you have a radical focus. I want you to get this. You were so focused. You were so focused on him, you were seeking him. You were seeking after his heart. And nothing else around you matters. The circumstances don't matter. The fiery trials of life, the things that you go through, suddenly become nothing. They're inconsequential. You're saying to yourself, that's all right. I'm fine. You can step into the worst of the worst of the worst. And you're like, man, I'm unscathed. I'm unharmed. See, some of you are stepping into that. Some of you are, are walking into that. There's, there's wounds that we all carry. Lord knows. We carry wounds. We've been beaten. We've been harmed. People have lied to us. People have deceived us. People, people have been unkind to us. Right? Some, some of us have endured abuse and neglect and all manner of horrible things. But you know what the Lord is doing? He's bringing you to a point where none of those things affect you. And going forward. Nothing that comes against you, it's not going to affect you the way it used to. You're not going to break down the way you used to. You can go into the flame and be fine. You're standing right in the midst of it. Because why? God is with you. David said in Psalm 23, Lord, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He said, yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. You see, whatever the enemy wants to use for evil, God will use it for your good. But you got to be able to have the radical focus. you got to be able to see God in the midst of the flames. In the midst of the trial, you got to say, I'm focused on him. 
oh, yeah, yeah, did you, did you hear what so-and-so said? No, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm focused on him, right? I'm not, I'm not looking down at my text. I'm focused on him. Oh, did you see what so-and-so post on Facebook? No, I'm focused on him, right? You're not even thinking about that. What happened over in North Korea? I don't know. I'm focused on him, right? It doesn't matter what was going on at so-and-so's church. I don't know. I'm focused on him. See, this is where the Lord is bringing us as the people of God. The Bible says in verse 28, the Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. The king is praising them because they defied his order. Wow. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their homes turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. See, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he was on the way. He didn't quite have it all right. Right? Like, you know, the whole cutting to pieces thing is a little extreme. But he was, he was exalting God the best way he knew how. Right? And that's important because you won't have the perfect praise right away. You're not going to be completely perfect right away, right? You're going to want to get tempted by the flesh at various times. You're going you're gonna to step out. Some of you might step out the door and, and get in your car and, and drive down the street. Somebody cut you off. You're going to you know, you, you're gonna, you're gonna want to let some choice words out. You're not going to be perfect right away. But he's going to perfect you along the way. He's going to walk with you into the trial. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. How many of you know promotion comes from the Lord? Promotion comes from the Lord. Wow. And see, this is what you call a radical change. One minute being public enemy number one, the next minute. Being big shots, top dogs in the kingdom. It's a radical change. And where does radical change begin? I want to share this with you. Radical change doesn't begin with what Pastor Brian wants in the church. Sometimes that, that's the perception that we might have. And that's any church, not just common ground, that's anywhere, right? Radical change doesn't begin with leaders who have the microphone. That's not what it's about. Radical change begins within each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Going forward in 2018, people say, Pastor Brian, what's the vision for Common Ground for 2018? It's turn up the heat. You, me, individually, we turn up the heat. And so when we come together corporately, there is radical change. We desire the ministry of Christ in our community. We desire the ministry of Christ to one another. There's a radical change I'm not going to connect to people the same way I used to or disconnect from people the same way I used to. I'm not going to do the very same things I used to do. The community makes a change. You see, I, I know people uh, who've lived up in, in New York City, and one of the cool things about living in New York City is that you see uh, various communities of people who, who rally together and you know, they're what we would consider foreigners or immigrants to the uh, United States. Um, but many of these people in their communities, they have standards for the community, right? And, and it could be Chinese, you know, it could be Italian. There are some who are Orthodox Jews who in their community, you already know this is how it goes down, right? This is the standard for the community. Do not go against the community. This is who we are. This is what we do. And that's exactly what the Lord is calling for us. Radical change as the community of God's people. To say, I'm going to commit to worship the Lord. I don't feel like it. I'm getting out of bed. I'll be at church. Right? I don't, I, I don't know that I feel it. I don't know. And listen. Mm, praise the Lord. Praise God. And please hear my heart when I say this. I don't want to say, I, I, well, I can't help it if it offends the flesh. I'll say that. But I'm going to tell you this. Feelings, feelings will get you in big trouble. 
feelings will mess your world up. I don't feel like it. I've been praying about it, and I feel like this. Well, you know what? That has to coincide with the truth. The truth of God's word. What does the truth say? Not what, what I think. Not what I like to do. Pastor Brian, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to attend that that outreach. Pastor Brian, I won't be at that service. Pastor Brian, I'm not going to do it. You know, that's fine. But if you want radical change, then you stand on the truth. Not what you feel. If I went by what I feel, I'd be hit and miss. You might see me preach some Sundays. And the other Sundays, I'm on vacation. That's that's real, right? The challenge is we don't operate by feelings. We operate by faith. We go by faith, not by sight. Right? And I'm going to take it a little deeper. You know, we operate by faith, not by sight. Not just in the physical. But sometimes what we see up here, what we see in our mind's eye, is not right. And we have to subdue the flesh, submit the flesh to God's truth. What does the truth of God's word say? I want to share with you out of the truth of God's word, and I want to begin to wrap up with this. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, Peter says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. He says, don't be surprised. Right? We often get surprised when things come about. We get surprised at difficult circumstances. We get surprised when we're affected a certain way. We get surprised that something comes along that, that, that tempts our flesh. Right? He says, look, don't be surprised. You're going to have tests. I shared with you last week, we can repeat tests over and over and over again. Or we can pass the test and graduate and move on. He said, don't be surprised at the test. It's not a pop quiz. It's life. This is the life that we live. Praise the Lord. It's not strange, Peter says. This is, this is the normal flow. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. How many of you sign up to suffer? That ain't popular, is it? That ain't going to preach all day. It just don't preach that way. I'm sorry. Little did you know you did. You sign up to suffer because we suffer with him. Everybody is willing to reign. Everybody is willing to have, have, a, have, have a great life. Everybody is willing to get what they're looking for. But not everybody is willing to suffer with Christ. To go through the fiery ordeal. To go through the trials. Amen. Amen. You see, 2018, we're looking for radical change. What it means that we're going to become more like Christ. The radical change we're doing is going to be looking more like him, believing more like him, trusting in God like him. Peter says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, basically, if, if you don't want to suffer like him, if, 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 if you don't find the life appealing to you, he says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of the glory and of God rest on you. He says, if you are insulted, Excuse me, others insult you for the name of Christ. If you suffer, it should be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. He says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? He says, and if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. What does Peter say? He says, listen, the people of God have got to be the ones who do the work of God, who honor God, who live out the creator's will, who conform to the pattern and image of Christ. 
We have to be those people. But he says that's where judgment begins. Jesus says, look, you can't look at your brother's eye and see the plank. Right? Well, excuse me, you can't look at your brother's eye and see the speck and you got a plank in your eye. Right? That's how he puts it. He says, first, you got to look at yourself. Before we radically transform the world, we've got to radically transform this. And if we look like the world and we do what the world does and we go with the flow and we bow down the way the world does, then we can't change anything. So our challenge today and every day this year is going to be, Lord, whatever comes, God's work in me. Allow the trials to perfect me. Allow your grace to be sufficient for me. And God, if I'm weak, if I'm, if I'm broken, God, I know you would give me the grace to help out. If I'm pushed into the furnace, it's okay, Lord, because you're with me. The Apostle Paul said, whether I'm abased or bound, I know how to do all things. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We're talking about radical change and at this time I want to welcome Kyle and Ashley up because uh, we got radical change coming and it will be different if it was bad but we praise God for what he does that's good and we honor him good morning it's a great message Pastor Brian it's great uh First, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Trish if she would put up a slide for me. I made a little collage for you guys to see. <laughs> Queen of slideshows right here. So, introducing Common Ground Worship Leaders of 2018. As you guys can tell, we have some new faces up there. It's pretty awesome, right? And if we do have anybody in this picture that is here this morning, I know Miss Linda is in the back with the children. But Dave and Trish, would you guys stand and just kind of give a little wave? And Thank you guys so much. You guys are a tremendous blessing to Common Ground. And 2018 is going to be amazing with you guys on the team. So thank you so much. Um, we have Alan, of course, who's been a part of the team uh, for a very, very long time. Actually, um, when I was pregnant with Levi... I told Alan, I said, okay, at some point, I'm having this baby, and you're the only one who can do this. And he had never uh, led worship before, and he was just starting to sing. And so I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to train you. I'm going to do the best I can. And then the baby came. He's like, I'm not ready. And I was like, it's too late. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> um, so we've been through um, some amazing challenges together, but all good ways for growth. Those, those hard challenges for us on the worship team are the best times because they push us even further as worship leaders. Amen. Um, we have Terry. He came on what, five years ago? Four or five? Yeah, man. Terry's been with us and uh, he's made some life shifts and he's come in and out and he's back in the game. So Terry has a lot to offer. He's, um, he has a lot of wisdom. And if you guys want to learn anything or, or learn to fix things, Terry's your guy. He's amazing at that. Uh, we have Teresa, which I've been training for the past two years, and she has come so far. <laughs> so far. I'm really proud of her. And Linda. Linda is an amazing um, spirit-filled uh, worship leader, and she's going to be a part of our first service um, worship leading. So we have some changes coming in 2018, and I wanted you guys to be able to see the faces, to get excited, to introduce them into a family and love on them, encourage them, because they need that. They go through a lot at home. They go through many, many challenges, and the enemy is constantly trying to take them out. And it's your job as the family, as the body, to encourage them and, and pull them out of those times. Amen? So as you notice in the slideshow, I am not in the slideshow. And that is because God has called Kyle and I and Levi, which is, Levi is not here this morning. Um, but he's calling us into something different um, outside of common ground. 
but I feel very confident that I'm leaving you guys with a great team, great team. And it's never been about a face. It's been my face for the past 10 years leading. You know, I've been attending here for 21 years. But I want you guys to understand, it's not about the faces that you have, but it's about the anointing. It's about the spirit of God in this place. And I, I'm trusting these guys to do that for you. And I hope that you guys put your faith in them and put your trust in them as your leaders. And I'm really going to miss you. We to go. <laughs> We're going to finish out the month, and um, January 28th is going to be um, our last Sunday here, um, so we have time. We have time to get used to the idea of something new, and if you guys have questions, you know, feel free to ask them. <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> Teresa, would you mind just playing a little bit? So, Pastor Brian's been talking about turning it up. Do you mind if I turn up the heat, Brian? Do you mind if I turn up the heat right now? Because I'm about to burn it down. We have been asking God, we have been studying, we've been seeking God to say, what am I called to do for so long? We've been here for so long. And for the last 10 years, we've been filling a need. We've been doing things. We've been equipping. We've been getting training. And we finally ask God, okay, God, am I doing what I'm called to do? Or have you called me to more? And back there this morning, I, I felt like the Lord just lit me on fire. All right, I don't know if y'all were paying attention to what he was saying. But I, I want to give you an example. that The Lord has downloaded and given us a vision and, and, and given us... A, a calling. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know where we're going. I just know that we've got to get it out. We've got to let it go. And if you guys will bear with me this morning, I feel like the Lord really has something that he wants to share for a couple of y'all. Joe, stand. Do you trust me? Stand up, brother. Stand up. Jay, do you trust me? Stand up, brother. Doug Collins, you trust me? Stand up, brother. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Pastor Brian said that those three men were the smartest, the brightest men in that town. And I can promise you that nobody has spoken into your lives like that. You have never felt, God's telling you, you have never felt like the smartest, like the bravest, like the strongest. He's calling you today to rise up, to stand up and you say, well, I'm not perfect. He said, I didn't call you to be perfect. He said, I called you to be available. Jay, the Lord is saying the, the freedom from addiction that I've given you is not your greatest testimony. He said, your greatest testimony is still to come. But take warning because that means there's still adversity. That means the enemy is still out there. But he has called you to more. He has called you just like Ken. Ken, where are you at? You said it earlier. You said you are blazing away for others. That is what the Lord has called you to do. And that's what we want to help do. We want to help go out and we want to help equip people. Doug, the Lord's saying you haven't felt worthy enough. Nobody has spoken into your life like I can. He said, listen to me. He said, I will be your source. He said, people will let you down. Your friends will let you down. He said, the ones you thought were there, they're gone. They're not going to be there. He said, I'm your friend. He said, I'm your brother. He said, I'm your father. He said, I have called you to be a father. I will be your source. I will show you what that means. Joe, he has called you. And you say, well, well, I, I can't be called. My, my, my life's not perfect. My family's not perfect. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, I've, it doesn't change the calling. The calling doesn't change. Our circumstances don't change the calling. How you respond to the circumstances is how you get to your calling. He said, I have called you to minister to families. 
He said, it is by the power of your testimony, by the blood of the lamb, that we will triumph over the enemy. You three gentlemen, there is somebody here today that's going to be coming through these walls. It's going to be coming through here within the next year, within the next day, that is going to desperately need something that you have, something that you have been through. There are people here that can speak into your lives. Between everybody in this room, and this is what I've been saying at the home group, between everybody in this room, we have been through it all. There is not one person in here that's been something that somebody else can't relate to. But the calling is the desperation. You've got to find it. You've got to seek it out. Somebody needs to hear what you have to say, Jay. You've got to find them. Somebody in here has to receive what Jay has to say. You've got to go find them. You've got to go ask them. You've got to go tell them. And he said, you will triumph over the enemy through the power of your testimony. Through the power of your testimony. You say, I don't even know what my testimony is. He said, you're living it right now. You are your testimony. And the work that he is going to do is going to shine a light for others and you are going to spread it around. That's the calling that God has given us. And we have got to get it out. We have got to go go and pursue it. We've got to be available. So I don't know what it looks like. You guys can sit down, man. I appreciate you guys. The Lord put you all in my heart this morning. have been equipping you guys for the last 10 years. We've been speaking into you. We've been pouring into you. You guys have been helping us along the way. All of our major life events have happened through this church. You guys watched us get married. You watched the new life of our son being born, brought into this world. You guys have been there through us with the, with the deaths in our family. It's all been here. It's all been here. You guys have been through it all. And we appreciate that. And we needed that. But now it's time. The DNA, what, what we've been doing here, it needs to go out. It needs to be experienced because we've got all the answers. This is like a storehouse. I'm telling you, man, I see it in the spirit. I see you guys coming in with like bazookas and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. The storehouse is here. The, 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 the power is here. So it's time to start asking these questions. I want to start using that. I want to start making a difference. I want to start moving forward. I'm tired of looking over my shoulder. I'm tired of waking up not knowing what I'm supposed to do. Ask God and he will reveal it. But you have to want it. You have to want it. The desperation has to be there. You got to turn up the heat. You got to turn up the heat. So we love y'all and we're, we're excited. We're excited. So we're going to be here for you guys for the next month. And uh, be praying for us and be here for y'all. Good word, man. Good word. Can y'all stay up here? Can y'all stay here? Can y'all stay right here? Yeah. Good word. Good word. Praise the Lord. Praise God. says give honor where honor is due and you know one of the the challenges that we've had at common ground in our history and you know some of you know uh, the legends because they predate me um, but our history at common ground has, has been that we've had challenges as far as people uh, leaving and separating and whatnot and, and we've communicated with Kyle and Ash you know Andrew and I have communicated with them and we've been very candid about the fact that we always everybody to know from this moment now going forward that we're doing this amicably that this is all about family it's all about love you know this is this is this is not something to where we we have to worry about who did what and how so and so doing this and whatnot and who split off and did that no no we want to show our community we want to show the body of Christ that you can do it right you can do it right. So we could love one another and we can say, God bless you and God bless your family. And at Common Ground, you know, we've always been, I've, I've always believed since I've been here for the past seven years now and since we've been here for the past seven years, since our family has been here, we've always believed that we were training ground. Kyle's vision couldn't be more accurate. We've always been here to equip people to build them up and as much as we want to hold on 
as much as we want a bunch, a bunch of super soldiers, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair to hold on. I don't know if you know, I was probably on tape a few months ago. I said, look, you better appreciate Ashley because she's not going to be with us forever. Right? Kyle's been a pillar of this church. We haven't seen, I didn't even know until recently all the stuff he did behind the scenes for our ministry. But you can't hold on forever. It's not fair. When you have people who are so dynamic, you've got to allow them to go forward and to bless the body of Christ because many of y'all know there's places out there that are struggling. They're hanging on by a shoestring and they need this power couple. They need them. They got to have them. We've been so blessed. We've been so fortunate. But that time has come. just yet. So I'm going to take advantage of it right now. If you need ministry, praise God. Hey, look, we, we want to take advantage. If you need prayer, if right now for 2018, if you're saying, man, I just, I need to be on fire. Like Kyle was saying, he, I set him on fire. He set me on fire. The Holy Spirit set us on fire. That's what matters. What, what really matters, right? right now is rising up. It's greater than my spirit, man. You need to come forward. You need to come forward. Joe Stevens, if I could use you, brother. Wifey, you got me. Praise the Lord. Praise God. What Pastor Quinn says, if I could use you guys just to, to pray. This is that time now. We're just going to let God do his thing. We're going to let God do his thing. But remember, radical change begins on the inside. Radical change begins with us. Kyle and Ashley felt it. They said, look, we got to make a radical change. It started with them, in them. What are you going to do now? I'm going to ask you, who's next? Who's stepping up? In order to step up and step out first, you got to subdue the flesh. Get rid of the junk and let's go forward. It's a new season, a new start. Not because people are going, but because 